Well, good morning, Radiant Church. I want to particularly welcome those that are watching online and those at our other campuses. Let's give them a big hand today. We're in a series called Holy Rebels, and we are rebelling against the forces of darkness with God's weapons of righteousness, holiness, and truth. And what we're seeing in this agenda of darkness that is coming against the church, coming against the world, that there is someone orchestrating it. And we have seen that his name is Satan. And we have looked at him a bit, and we've started in Ephesians chapter 6. So let's go back there again this morning, and let's take a look. Paul's writing here, and we're just going to look at one verse, verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, we have seen the devil is another name for Satan or our adversary, our tempter. He's also called the destroyer. He led a rebellion against God, and because of that, he was thrown out of heaven. And he still has an agenda to diminish the glory of God, to pursue his own glory, to destroy those made in the image of God, and he is in particular opposition to the church of Jesus Christ. We're being opposed. And to oppose us, he has what Paul calls wiles. Wiles. Now, I looked at various translations to see what that word wiles possibly meant. And some of the translations use the word strategies. Others use schemes, tactics, and even evil tricks. Over in 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul tells us that Satan could take advantage of us if we are ignorant of his devices. So let's not be ignorant. Let's understand what his wiles are, what his tactics are. And that's what we're going to look at today. And we're going to see them in the very first mention of Satan in the Bible. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. It's interesting, Satan isn't seen in the first or second chapters of the Bible, nor is he in the last two chapters of the Bible. But in between that, he seems to be attacking everywhere. And we see it here in Genesis 3, verse 1. Let's read it together. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Here is the first tactic of our adversary, and that is disguise. Satan doesn't show up in a red suit with a pitchfork with cloven hoofs. He doesn't show up with horns on his head. If he did, we'd go, wow. That must be the devil. He doesn't show up that way. He comes disguised. And here he comes as a serpent. Now, some theologians believe it was a serpent or a snake possessed by the devil. Others see this as a metaphor for his character and personality, and it simply calls him a serpent. But we do know that it was Satan. We know that from the New Testament. Paul tells us that in 2 Corinthians 11.3. We also see it in the book of Revelation where he's called that old serpent the devil. Now, as I said, this is the first mention of Satan. And he's called a serpent because serpents are subtle. They're stealthy. They're hard to detect. They're dangerous and they're deadly. I remember one time I took my kids to go climbing a small mountain and uh, when we went up to the top of the mountain, we were coming back down, and it had been just horrible. Everything about that trip, nothing went well. It was a struggle. It was a battle. It was a challenge. We were coming down, and my daughter, Faith, was trying to have the best attitude. And she said, Dad, that was hard, but I think it was good for us. About that moment, a snake darted right in front of us. And she said, Dad, this is the worst day ever. You know, people don't like snakes. They're sneaky. They, they sneak up on you, and they can be deadly. Over in 2 Corinthians eleven four, 4, Paul writes, Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. Satan is tricky. He doesn't come off as the devil. If we knew it was the devil, we'd run. But he comes disguised. Now, I have known people over the years periodically hear a testimony where Satan literally appears to someone or a demon appears to someone in malevolent brilliance, and they look quite extraordinary. But that is not the norm. I've never seen that. I only know a few people who ever have. Usually, he comes disguised. 
He comes maybe as an entertaining movie or a social influencer or a well-meaning friend or a concerned relative or a compelling university professor or a woke pastor in a clerical collar. But Satan comes disguised. He comes in ways that we don't expect. I think you see this in the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 13. Let me read this passage. It's quite interesting. It says, then I saw, and this is John speaking of his vision, then I saw another beast. Now we know when you go through the book of Revelation, the beast is Satan. The beast, rather, is the Antichrist. He's being controlled by Satan. He's being used by Satan. But the beast is the Antichrist. And then there's another beast, you find, and he appears here. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Well, in the book of Revelation, we know who the lamb is. The lamb is always Jesus. So you look at this one and you say, look, it's Jesus. But he speaks like a dragon. Actually, he's a beast. He appears so precious. He appears so caring and empathetic. He appears like someone who we would be drawn to. But here he's the false prophet who is of the unholy trinity in the book of Revelation who's leading people away from God into the Antichrist. That is how he often works. He comes in a disguise. You certainly see this in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus and his disciples are in Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Well, they rattle off some ideas. And finally, Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, congratulations, Peter. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Well, Peter's feeling quite good about himself. And a little later, Jesus tells them that he is going to be beaten and he is going to be crucified, but then he's going to rise from the dead. And Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. Jesus spins around to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. Satan had come disguised as Peter (laughs) because he had influenced Peter in such a way that the message he was given was a demonic message. It was a satanic message. It was to get Jesus off the course he was to be on. And Satan will use people around us. He'll send messages to us from people that seem well-meaning, that seem caring, that seem anything but demonic, but that's how Satan works. He speaks in various ways. And the only way we can discern the voice of Satan is if we know the voice of God. We have to know God's word. We have to know what God said because it enables us to determine whether the voice we're hearing is the voice of God, whether it's the voice of man, or whether it's the voice of Satan. A second tactic of the enemy is deception. Look on here in Genesis 3, at the end of verse 1. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Here's Satan's opening salvo. Has God indeed said? The first thing he does is he attacks the word of God. He tries to discredit the word of God. Is that really what God said? You always know the voice of Satan when that voice is trying to discredit the scripture. You know, there's many interpretations. So how can you possibly know what it's saying? I mean, it was written so long ago. You realize it was written in a completely different language than we use today. How can you possibly know what it's saying? It questions the word of God. It questions the credibility of Scripture. Look at verses 2 and 3, because here's the woman's response. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. So she's responding to tell him what God actually said. But of the trees of the fruit, which are in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, here's her first mistake. She's getting into an argument with the devil. She's entering into a conversation with Satan. That is never very effective. You simply dismiss him. 
Or as James says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. That's what you should have done. Get out of here, Satan. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to talk to you. But how many of us entertain satanic thoughts? Did you see how, he, how she looked at you? Did you hear what he said about you? Can, can we really trust God in this? I, I don't know if God's going to come through. And those thoughts come to our mind and we entertain them and we consider them and we roll them around in our mind. Maybe we talk to somebody else about them. What she should do is simply say, enough of you. I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to listen to things contrary to the scripture. I am committed to what God has said, and I'm not going to listen to your voice. But she begins to listen to Satan. She debates Satan. And Eve is not accurately explaining what God has said. On more than one hand, she's doing this completely wrong. For instance, she said that they could eat of the trees of the garden, but God had said you can freely eat. In other words, I'm providing you with abundance. You can have anything you want here. This is all yours, except just this one tree. But that's not how she relays it. It's as if God isn't as good as he really is. And then she said, when it comes to the fruit, you can't touch it. Well, God never said you can't touch it. God said you can't eat it. She's going to go on to say that God, instead of saying you shall surely die, least you die, which sounds like a least stringent judgment for this. So she's changing. She's manipulating what God says. And people do that all the time. And what we see in Eve is what we see in our society constantly. On the one hand, you have the legalist who adds to the word of God. On the other hand, you have the liberalist. And the liberalist always takes away from the word of God. You can't really trust the scripture. I don't think that's what that means anymore. That doesn't apply to this culture. That doesn't apply to this time. That is the liberalist. And there's a lot of liberalists today. There are liberalists who are denying the truth of the scripture. A survey was just out this week where they interviewed born-again Christians. They identified themselves, self-identified, born-again Christians, and almost 70% of them said Jesus is not the only way to God. And yet in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. They are denying the exclusivity of the gospel. They're denying that Jesus Christ is the only way. They're cutting out that part of the Bible. Je Jesus didn't, I mean, surely he didn't mean, he must not have known about Buddha. I mean, he, he wasn't aware that Muhammad was coming. He didn't realize there would be many paths that would lead to God. You know, Jesus was just living there in Galilee. He couldn't know all this. I don't know how they go about it. But they discredit because we have a culture who is so pluralistic that couldn't possibly believe there's only a narrow way and there's only one way. And so they deny the truth of the scripture. That is a liberalist. The legalists, though, on the other hand, is those who say, yeah, there's the Bible plus all of these other things. I think you see this with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were those who were denying the scripture. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in spirits. They, they were taking away from the word of God. Then you had the Pharisees, and they were adding to the word of God. They took the commandments of God, the scripture of God, and they said, Plus, 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 plus. And of course, the most damnable heresy of that is that salvation comes through Jesus plus something besides Jesus. So people fall on either end. And Eve is falling on to this trap from both ends. <laughs> That's the time we live in. And Paul told us this time was coming. Over in 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul says... The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith, listen to this, and follow deceiving spirits. All of this is because people fall into deception. They're listening instead of listening to the voice of God, instead of standing on the word of God, they're listening to deceiving spirits and things, listen to this, taught by devils. 
There are people who are getting their doctrine from devils. And Paul is warning us of those people. False religions, false teachers. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 calls Satan the god of this world who blinds people's minds. Revelation 12, 9 says that in the tribulation, he is going to deceive the whole world. Now, one awful deception today that many of you are aware of is gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is a deception. It's a deception, and it's become a popular fad where people like to talk about gender fluidity. There's a lot of young people today who, who want to be gender fluid. Now, where did this come from? Well, it came from a small fraction of people who have a disorder where there's a disconnect between who they think they are and their biological reality. So a person who is born biologically male feels that they're actually a female trapped in a male body. That is gender dysphoria. And there is a very small sliver of the population that's affected. And the problem is that they're denying the truth of reality and instead they're believing their feelings. And it's sad. My heart goes out to these people. I, I feel very bad for them. And they need help. They need counsel. They need biblical counseling. But you know what they get instead? They're told you need to get on hormone blockers. You need to have gender surgery. You need to change who you are to match who you really are. But here's the reality. You can go through a hundred plastic surgeries. You can have all kinds of hormones shot into your body. But every single cell of your body is still going to be the DNA of your original biological birth. Even more significantly, Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Understand, gender is not a social construct, but it's a creation of the living God. God created them male and female, and that is is sacred. So rejecting your God-giving gender is equivalent to rebelling against your creator. Yet today we deny the truth, and instead we embrace our feelings. And this is something we all need to learn. Because what the enemy wants us to do is to trust our feelings over the truth. And it seems so greatly there that you see the biological reality and say, that's not true. How I feel is actually true. But we do that all the time. This is what God has said, but I feel this way. So I don't know if I can trust what God said. Now, I want you to see how that works with gender dysphoria. Because in other areas, we are wise if we don't treat life that way. For instance, let's say that uh, you meet someone who's extremely anorexic. They are extremely thin. They're nearly starving themselves to death, but they're anorexic. So when they look in the mirror, they don't see an emaciated person. They see a fat person. They see an obese person. And they say, oh my goodness, I'm so fat. I'm so obese. Can you help me? And if you look at them and you were to say to them, here's what you need to do. We need to get you on a very strict exercise regimen. And we need to cut back your calories as much as we possibly can. You would be doing them the worst disservice because you would be going with their feelings instead of their reality. But that is exactly what is going on with gender dysphoria and gender confusion. And that is exactly what we do in our lives where we deny the truth that we know is the truth of God. And we say, I'm going to go with my feelings and how I feel about it instead of what God says about it. And so that is exactly what Eve is doing here. She knows what God has said, but now she's beginning to question. She's beginning to doubt. She doesn't really understand anymore. Where the scripture is clear, as believers, we must live according to truth and tell our feelings to line up with the truth. If something is true and you're feeling another way, you say feelings line up with truth. I'm a man. I need to get help. I need to understand my identity instead of denying the truth and going with something that's going to destroy my life. 
So, so far, we've seen that Satan uses disguise. He uses deception. But he also uses lies. Look at verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. That is a blatant lie. Because God said in Genesis 2.16, in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Satan is lying about what God said. Satan is lying and he's not telling the truth. Now, here's how you know if Satan is lying. You can always know if he's moving his lips because he's a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said that in John 8, verses 14 and 15. He speaks to those in that day and says, so you're of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, or literally, he speaks his native language. You know, some of us in this room speak English, the majority of us. There's some here that speak German this weekend. There's some this weekend who speak Spanish. Jesus speaks the truth. Satan speaks lies. Every time he speaks, it's a lie. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Satan is a liar. If you're listening to the devil, you're listening to lies. I remember when my children were younger, they would actually say, well, the devil told me. And we said, well, why are you listening to him? He's going to lie to you. He's going to tell you something that isn't true. But many of us listen to his lies all the time. What do his lies sound like? Well, let me give you a few. You're going to hear a lie like God doesn't love you or all the things that are going wrong in your life wouldn't be happening. That's a lie. You've done too much wrong. God could never use your life. That's a lie. You can't change. You're just always going to be a loser. That's a lie. There's no hope. You might as well just give up. That's a lie. Those are lies. And those are lies he speaks to our minds. And that's what you hear from Satan. Nothing but lies. And you see how we are to respond to that when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. In Luke chapter 4, every time Satan came with a lie, Jesus didn't argue with him. Jesus didn't debate with him. Jesus simply said, it is written. Here's the truth. He came back at him with the truth. That's what you and I have to do because you're hearing lies. You're hearing deceptions. They're coming to your mind. They make you discouraged. They make you feel defeated. They make you feel overwhelmed. And when those lies come, you have to say, it's written. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. Here's a truth bomb, devil, and give him the truth. Give him the truth. Verse 5. Satan goes on to say, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What is Satan doing here? He's questioning the goodness of God. God doesn't have your best in mind. God's holding out on you. If you would just listen to me, your life would be so much better. Because God doesn't really want your best. He doesn't want your fulfillment. He doesn't want your absolute flourishing. He's holding back. He knows something he's not letting you know about. But understand, God's guidelines, God's boundaries, God's ways are always for our best. And then Satan gives the grand temptation. Throw God off, declare yourself independent of God, and you shall be as God. You'll be a God unto yourself. You'll be able to call your own shots. You'll be able to do your own thing. You'll be independent of God. There'll be no more restraints. There'll be no more things holding you back. That was the original lie. They're going to end up believing this, and it's going to blitz the entire human race. And wasn't that Satan's original sin where he said, I will be like the most high God? And now he's tempting Adam and Eve with the sin he fell into, and they're going to fall into the same sin. Look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant in the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. Now, Eve's eyes have gotten off of God and gotten on the tree. What this is called is Satan's fourth tactic, and that is misdirection. Satan is always trying to get your direction off of looking at God, 
off of keeping your eyes on Jesus, off of his word, and on to something else. He'll try to get you focused on something that becomes a fixation in your thinking. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, the apostle John said, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. This is exactly what happened. This is where Satan tries to distract us and misdirect us. First of all, with the lust of the flesh. Notice what was told to the woman. She saw that it was good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. Then it was pleasant to the eye. That's the next one, the lust of the eye. And then a tree desirable to make one wise. That is the pride of life. Flesh, passions, pride, and of all those, pride is really our worst enemy. It allows Satan's deception to be so effective. Pride led to the fall of Lucifer. Pride is what made I shall be as God so attractive and so appealing. Pride causes us to think we know better than God, that we have a better way, that we understand things better than he does. Pride tells us we deserve this. God may be saying it's not right, but I deserve it. That's pride. That's pride. And Eve fell into pride. King David did the same. You know, Satan so tactically and so incredibly used misdirection in David's life. And a lot of us can relate to this. Over in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see David at his height. He's around 50 years old, and he has reached the pinnacle. He is one of the most powerful men in the world. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world. He's taken this little uh, city of dust, and he's turned it into a, a city of gold. It's this amazing city there in Jerusalem. He has the presence of God right there in the city. He has a relationship with God. He has an amazing family. He has everything a man could want. And then one day he gets misdirected and he sees this woman named Bathsheba. And that's the one thing he didn't have. And that's all he can think about. He's totally misdirected toward Bathsheba. I got to have her. I need to have her. And how many of us are like that? God has blessed us so much. We have so many things, so many things that can be used for God. God has such purposes for us, such a plan for us. But we see one thing, oh, if I only had that. If I could only get that, if only I'd done this so I could have that, maybe there's a way to get that. You're misdirected. You've lost sight of eternity. You've lost sight of what's really important because you have been misdirected just like David was. Look at verse 6. This is really going to get good now. She also gave to her husband, look at these next two words, with her... And he ate. Now, if you're like me, the first time I'm reading the story, I'm thinking, <laughs> where's that man? Where's Adam? Is he out playing with the animals somewhere? What's going on? But he was right there with her. He was standing there with her. Now, I want you to think about it. God had given Adam dominion over all the earth. Adam and Eve were God's vice regents in the earth. They were given dominion, they were given authority, and then they were given a responsibility to tend and keep the garden. Who are they to keep it from? Satan, from the serpent. So the serpent comes in. Adam just watches what's going down. Just watching it. This is really wild. Watching what's going. What he should have done is stepped in. He should have said, serpent, you get your tail out of this garden. But he didn't. He didn't take his responsibility. He didn't stand up and do what God had called him to do. He stood by silently. He did nothing. Now notice he's not the one doing this stuff. He sees everything's kind of falling apart. But instead of stepping in to do anything, he just stands there silently by. And how many people are doing that in the day in which we live? German theologian and Nazi dissident Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. When you see danger, destruction, damnation coming, the worst thing you can do is stand and say nothing. 
You're culpable. He is totally culpable in Eve's sin. But he didn't say anything. That's the problem. But he didn't step in and do anything. That's the problem. Folks, listen to me. Parents, listen to me. God has given you dominion. He's given you responsibility for your family. He has given you responsibility in your workplace. How many men have I talked to over the years, including talking to myself, when they have an employee who is nothing but trouble? He's causing confusion, division, not getting the work done, not doing what he's supposed to do. And they'll come to me and say, could you pray with me and pray for this employee? And you know what I'll say? It won't do any good because God has given you dominion. You have to confront them. You need to talk to them about this because God's given you dominion. It wouldn't have done any good for Adam to step back and pray that God would get the serpent out. He had the responsibility to drive the serpent out. In your family, how many parents are forlorn over their children, how they're acting, how they're living? Do you know what they're watching? Do you know where they're at on the internet? Do you know what kind of music they're listening to? Do you know who they're going out with as friends? Because all of those influences have gotten them to where they're at now, and you've stood by and done nothing. Folks, it's time to man up. It's time to woman up. It's time to do what Adam failed to do. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So the woman was deceived by the serpent. Adam was looking on, seeing the whole thing, recognizing the problem, understanding the problem, but his problem was he did nothing. I know people in our society today, boy, America's sure doing horrible. Wow. Can you believe these things are doing? Can you believe what people are believing? Can you believe what we're allowing to go on? Boy, I wish somebody would do something about it. Well, well, why don't you speak up? Why don't you go to a school board meeting? Why don't, why don't you do something? Why don't you talk to some people about this? Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't have time to vote or anything. What? 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 You're just going to stand idly by and do nothing as our entire nation is going to hell? Are you just going to stand by and do nothing? Come on, on, Adam. Come on, Adam. Step up, Adam. It's time to step up. Adam did nothing. And then, then what's he do? Finally, when he does do something, he says, yeah, that fruit looks pretty good. She says, here you go. And he eats it. Why did he eat it? He knew better. He wasn't deceived. He knew what was going on. He knew everything was falling apart. If he eats it, but he eats it, why does he eat it? I think, the scripture doesn't say. I'm just going to suppose here, because I know how people think, and I think the original person thought this way. I love this woman. I let her down, and I love her, and so I'm going to embrace her sin And I, too, am going to take of the fruit. You know, we have that going on in our society today, where you have parents who are falling into the trap of lies and deception, denying their deepest core values because they love their family members. And many times, they contributed to where their family member is to begin with. That's what Adam did. That's what Adam did. Look down in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Okay, suddenly they feel guilt. Suddenly they feel shame. Suddenly they feel all of these things. So what do they do to fix it? The world's falling apart. Nothing's working out. All hell's breaking loose. How do we fix this? Let's get us some fig leaves. That'll do it. Come on, we can figure this out. We can make this work. We'll just put on fig leaves. And that is how man tries to respond. We have rebelled against God. We've rejected God's word. We've rejected his truth. We believe the lies of the devil. The world's falling apart. And what do we say? We got to fix this. Do we turn to God? Do we repent? 
Do we go back to God's ways? Oh, no, 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 no. We, can, we mess this up, we can fix it. We got fig leaves. I got a fig leaf here. I, liberation theology, that'll do it. Critical race theory, that'll do it. Extreme environmental action, that'll do it. What are those things? Well, people see injustice, they see things wrong, they see, and we can fix it. Nothing to do with God in any of those things. Nothing to do with biblical values. Nothing to do with repentance. Nothing to do with forgiveness. Nothing to do with anything biblical. It's what can we do to fix it? It's not going to work. It's fig leaves. Didn't work for Adam. Didn't work for Eve. It's fig leaves. It's fig leaves. Trying to do it. Oh, let's just embrace Marxist ideology. That's going to fix it. Man's solutions never fix man's problems. The answer to the problem is the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the word of God. It's the truth that sets us free. Every one of those and every other man-made idea will bring us into bondage. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, I want you to see something beautiful here. They had become accustomed to walking with God. They had this incredible, amazing relationship with God. Verse 9, then the Lord called out to Adam and said, where are you? Now, something you need to learn. Whenever God asks a question, it's not for his information. He is the omniscient God. That means he knows everything. He knew everything that was going on. He says, where are you so that you will confess where you are and you will repent from where you are? So how does Adam respond to where are you? Verse 10. So he said, this is Adam. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Understand this. Whenever God asks us a question, whenever God deals with our heart, whenever God calls us out, whenever you're feeling conviction by the Holy Spirit, God wants you to run into the light and confess. The enemy wants you to run into the dark and hide. That's what Adam did. Verses 11 and 12. And he said, this is God. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree of the tree. Let me try that again. The woman who you gave to be with me gave me of the tree and I ate it. Now, I like to say Adam took it like a man. He blamed his wife. He had a responsibility, but he blames her. He didn't have to do what he knew he shouldn't do, but he blames her. This is called blame shifting, and it happens all the time. Instead of taking responsibility, we tend to want to give blame. And what we're seeing here in the Garden of Eden is division. And that's the final tactic of the enemy. He wants to bring division. Look at verse 13. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So she sees it. She, she's far more commendable than Adam here. She admits to her sin. She admits to what she did. There's division right now in our world. Incredible division. And you know who the source of it is? Satan. It's the adversary. It's the enemy. However, how do we come about bringing, how, how in this case would they bring about reuniting and unity once again? They're going to have to go back to what God said. They're going to have to come back in line with God's truth. In fact, Jesus talked about this in John chapter 17. He said, my prayer for you is that you be one even as I and the Father are one. Wow. But before he said that, he said, sanctify them by your truth. The only thing that brings unity is truth in the body of Christ. 
What brings unity anywhere is common shared values. This nation used to be more united because we had more common shared values. There were more things we agreed about than we disagreed on. But over time, America has drifted from its biblical values. Now, America was never a perfect nation. But even when we sinned or had heinous things in our history, they were changed because we appealed to biblical values. You remember during segregation, Martin Luther King Jr., he appealed to the Bible. Today, if he were to do that, nobody would know what he was talking about because we've lost that. So we don't have anything to unite around anymore. So now what it is, is power makes right. Who's the loudest voice? Who has the most power? Political power, military power. Who can force the others into submission? Who can silence the other? Who can make them do what they want? Because we're not united around certain values. Now, understand, if you have a small group and you really want commitment You have to have a high standard for what we unite around. For instance, here in this church, if you want to be a member of this church, there are certain statements you have to agree to to be a member of Radiant Church. But to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ here in Colorado Springs, that narrows way down to just a few things. You know, basically you need to believe the Apostles' Creed. And you're part of the Church of Jesus Christ here in Colorado Springs. See, see, it it enlarges. When it comes to the whole nation, well, there's just certain things we need to believe and be united around. We don't have those anymore. We don't have those anymore. People keep talking unity, unity, unity in this nation. Until we have values we can unite around, we're never going to have unity. Tell you what we need, and it's the only hope for America. Either... (laughs) Either we're going to continue to reject and throw off biblical values, become more and more secular until younger generations can be indoctrinated into lies and deception and will garner around lies and deception, and that's what will unite us. Or we're going to have a national awakening, national repentance, turning back to God and establish some values in this nation that are biblical. One or the other. One or the other. One or the other. You say, but, but doesn't Jesus always bring unity? Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said in Luke 12, verses 51 to 53, do you suppose that I came to bring peace on the earth? I tell you, <laughs> not at all, <laughs> but rather division. Did, 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 you, did, you, did you catch that? Jesus said, I came here. What did I come for? I'm a, I've come to bring division. <laughs> for from now on, five and one house will be divided Three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son, son against father. A mother against her daughter, a daughter against her mother, a mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Amos 3.3 says, how can any two walk together unless they be agreed? Don't be surprised if you're feeling more division in your life because of Jesus, because Jesus said it was going to happen. Jesus said it was going to happen. But you've got to decide, am I going to have a fidelity to truth? Despite what happens, am I going to stand for the truth? Am I going to believe the truth? Am I going to refuse to back down from the truth? Because I'm going to tell you, all of the devil's lies always lead to bondage. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Now, we have looked at Satan's tactics. Next week, we're going to look at how you overcome Satan's tactics. So if you leave here today, I haven't helped you much. If you come back next week, you're going to be so glad. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that, wow, in this book, you give us explanation of why things are the way they are in the world. You help us to understand why life is the way it is because you're the God of truth. You know the end from the beginning and you know what we don't know. And we submit ourselves to your truth and we declare, oh God, your word is truth 
and we submit ourselves to it today. And we choose to believe the truth over our feelings, to believe the truth over our culture, to believe the truth over the lies that are happening in our world. We choose truth. We believe truth. We stand by truth. For it's only the truth that will set us free. And Father, I pray that we would leave here with a new commitment to your word, a new commitment to your truth. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.